weapons of mass destruction. I thought, well, something's going to happen. The idea was take actions after 9-11 that would so shock state supporters of terrorism around the world that we might be able to get them to change their policies regarding support for terrorism and pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. General Franks is both a warrior but also a wise and inspiring commander. A declassified memo from November 2001 reveals that Donald Rumsfeld met as early as then with CENTCOM Commander General Tommy Franks to review plans for the decapitation of the Iraqi government. They discuss ideas of how to start a war. One suggestion is to create a dispute over WMD inspections. This is a regime that agreed to international inspections, then kicked out the inspectors. 9-11 made it politically possible for the first time to persuade the American people to break a tradition of not launching offensive wars. The pressure to find evidence falls heavily on all 15 U.S. intelligence agencies. The extremely strong policy wind that was blowing at the time and that everyone in government corridors felt made it absolutely clear what was preferred and what was not preferred. Atta, Mohammed Atta, leader of Al-Qaeda's 9-11 hijackings. From Prague comes a Czech intelligence report of a photograph allegedly showing Mohammed Atta meeting with a high-ranking Iraqi intelligence officer. The photograph of the supposed meeting is never made publicly available. Mohammed Atta was a slight guy, barely, what, 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, and skinny. The guy in the photograph was muscular and thick and had a neck the size of two of my necks. And I mean, that's not Muhammad Atta in the photograph, but send it to the lab anyway. And, and in my mind, the matter's put to bed. In the final analysis of- But even without uh, definitive evidence, the vice president goes public with it. It's been pretty well confirmed that he did go to Prague and he did meet with uh, a senior official of the Iraqi intelligence service in Czechoslovakia last April. Several I was sitting attacked. in my den oh, in my home in Washington, D.C. Was, uh, and I remember looking at the TV screen saying, what did I just hear? And I, first time in my life, I actually threw something at the television because I couldn't believe what I had just heard. Over and over again, the vice president for years would say, we had a report of this meeting. It's true. There was a report, and nobody believed it. That's what they didn't add. We clearly know that there... In a PBS interview on The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice reveals with certainty more evidence of Saddam's supposed terrorist link. We know, too, that um, several of the detainees, uh, in particular some high-ranking detainees, have said that uh, Iraq provided some training uh, to al-Qaeda in uh, chemical weapons uh, development. The key high-ranking detainee Rice is referring to is an al-Qaeda commander named Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi. He's at first interrogated by the FBI using standard interrogation techniques, but the CIA wants more. They seize control of him, they send him to Egypt where he's rendered and turned over to one of the most brutal intelligence services in the world. This is Al Libby years later in a Libyan prison being visited by his family. This video was recently located by Michael Isakoff. Within weeks of his interrogation in Egypt, Al Libby coughs up this story that he hadn't told the FBI before that Saddam was training al-Qaeda in chemical and biological weapons. It's the single most frightening story that could have been told post 9-11. Almost from the outset, the intelligence community has doubts about the claim. A 2002 CIA report states that questions persist about al-Libi's forthrightness and truthfulness, and that in some instances, he seems to have fabricated information. After the invasion, Al-Libi will recant the story that was extracted by the Egyptians' brutal interrogation. 
What we said at the time was, look, he said two different things at two different times. And we will tell the policy consumers and other analysts in the community both stories. You choose to believe what you choose to believe, but I don't know which one's accurate. The administration chooses to believe the connection. We've learned that Iraq has trained al-Qaeda members in bomb making and poisons and deadly gases. Right up to the war and beyond, it remains a key administration argument for war. And the public largely trusts it to be true. If you look at all the key pieces of evidence that they presented publicly at the time, on every single one of them, not only was there doubt, there was debate within the intelligence agencies of the U.S. government. The intelligence community assessed that Saddam Hussein was building a mobile biological weapons capability to avoid detection by the U.S. and its allies. And the assessment was based almost entirely on one source from the German government, a source named Curveball. His real name, as far as they know, is Rafid Ahmed Alwan an Iraqi engineer who makes his way to Germany and tells German intelligence that he worked in Saddam's mobile weapons labs used to develop weapons of mass destruction. In the intelligence community, Curveball was known to be a fabricator. He could not be relied upon. His intelligence was always, had been sort of stamped, you know, <laughs> do, not, do not disseminate, this is, this is useless. Curveball is a lone and seriously suspect source and U.S. intelligence agencies rely solely on German reports. They never actually question him themselves. In this 2011 interview with Britain's newspaper, The Guardian, the man called Curveball confirms the lies of his pre-war claims. This particular issue about the supposed mobile labs uh, was mishandled all the way around, certainly by the intelligence community in terms of how it was assessed, and then became the very heart of the whole case about unconventional weapons. With dubious evidence like that, the White House will present its case for war. Lobster Fest is the king of all promotions. There's nothing like a grilled lobster and lobster tacos. The Bar Harbor Bake is really worth trying. Get more during Red Lobster's Lobster Fest with the year's largest selection of mouth-watering lobster entrees, like our delicious lobster lover's dream, featuring two kinds of succulent lobster tails, or our savory new grilled main lobster and lobster tacos. It's back, but not for long.